Welcome back to Interlinguistics. Today we'll look at the second lecture in morphology, which will cover derivational and inflectional morphemes, as well as some processes in morphology. So, let's start off. Derivational morphemes. A derivational morpheme will change the category of a word, or it will alter the meaning of a word. So for instance, we have sing er. This er here is an affix. So it attaches to a stem. So we have this af, and sing is a verb. So sing and er come together to form singer, and the result is a noun. So this sing, this v, becomes an n. This verb becomes a noun, and that is what this er suffix does. Okay, let's take a look at poisonous. Poison is a noun. This us affix is something that attaches to poison. So in the end we get poisonous, and what is that? That is an adjective. So this us suffix takes a noun and changes it to an adjective. And you might be thinking, hold on a second, what about the verb to poison? So let's think about that. To poison, what if it's a verb that takes, or sorry, this us attaches to a verb and makes it an adjective? Well, let's think of another word. Let's think of the word adventure. Adventurous. So we can add us to it to make adventurous. And adventure is a noun. So this us probably attaches to nouns. I know you may say, what about to adventure? Um, does anyone say to adventure? I will go to adventure. No, we say I will go on an adventure. So this is definitely not a verb. This attaches to nouns. So it's very important to make that distinction and test other words when you can't figure out, hey, is this a noun base? Is it a verb base? So definitely try other words to see what attaches. Of course, when you're looking at other languages, uh, you have no idea. So hopefully your examiner will give you a hint. Second, inflectional morphemes. So these reflect grammatical agreement or features of a language. So for instance, reads. Read is a verb. S is an affix. And together, this forms the verb reads. Now what is this S actually? This is the third person singular. So reads, he reads, I read, he reads. So this S is a grammatical agreement. So this does a grammatical agreement with third person singular. What about greater? Well, it's great. So it's uh, what we want to say, it's an adjective. And this er is an affix. And together it makes greater, which is also an adjective but we call this one the comparative ER. So this er compares to things. So great becomes greater. And it's a grammatical function. It is not a meaning function. So that is very important to make the distinction there. Um, in my first video, I made a little bit of an error. So hopefully this one will be a little bit more clear. So great er, these are grammatical suffixes. Um, there's a total of eight in English, so you have third person singular, you have plural, you have possessive, comparative, uh, superlative, EST for great est, um, as well as a couple more verbs that I can't think of off the top of my head. So, that's the difference between derivational and inflectional morphemes. So, there is another issue we should talk about with morphemes, and that is that they're not always suffixes or prefixes. Sometimes, the same function will occur differently. So we say it's not always concatenative. We don't always add something to the end of words to show morphology. So for instance, when we want the past tense of sing, this i becomes an a. So this sing becomes sang. We don't add the past ed to the end. We do this internal change. We do this uh, partial suppletion. Now, partial suppletion occurs when the inside of a word is changed slightly. So this i becomes an a, so sing becomes sang. However, when we do the past tense of jump, 
we just add this ed here. So there's two ways that we can show this plus past in English. We can take a present tense verb, put it into the past, and we have different results. Um, why do we do this? Look historically, because modern people definitely are not making the rules of how language work. Um, I'm sure children, uh, what children will do when they acquire these words, they'll start off with saying sing, eventually they'll pick up sang because they hear it, and then when they learn this ed pattern, they'll start saying singed, and then eventually they'll revert back to sang. So we have this sort of um, shift in learning where they learn this rule, and then eventually they have to break it apart again and say, wait, not all words go with this rule, and English is very messy. So uh, there's two different ways that we can show past tense in English, and a lot of our morphemes work like this. Think of the word um, for plural. We have kids, parents, and then we don't say childs, we say children. What's up with that? Who knows? It's like the only plural S in English. The only plural morpheme in English that isn't an S. So that's another case, but we won't get into that. So that's internal change. Um, another way is suppletion. So we can have a word like I am, I go, and when we take the past or the present or the future, um, it just becomes completely different. So am, what rules can we change m to add something to it to become the past? Um, we don't do anything, this am becomes a was. I am, I was. What's the connection between these two words? Look historically because I have no idea. How did am become was? Great question, no idea. What about go? What's the past tense of go? It's went. What do you mean go and went? How does go become went? That's what all ESL uh, students are thinking. Why is go went? No idea. Irregular verb? Who knows? This is suppletion. That's an example of suppletion. Complete change of the word. So no affix, just complete change. No, no partial suppletion even. There's nothing in went that is resemblance of a g or an o. That's complete suppletion. So these occur with a lot of words in English. Um, be, is, was, will, won't. Um, I'm trying to think of some others, but these two are the primary examples. Reduplication. Um, so reduplication is another process, another morphological process where we take part of the word and we repeat it again immediately after. So in English we could say, yeah, it was so-so, or teeny-weeny, itsy-bitsy. So in so-so we repeat the whole first word, teeny-weeny, we repeat the eeny part, itsy-bitsy, we repeat itsy, we add the b for bitsy. So they do mean things, um, we don't use them that often in English. However, in Marshallese, which is a language, um, they do use this reduplication process. Uh, so for instance, kagir is belt, and that's a noun. It's an article of clothing or something you can wear. Now when they say to wear something, the verb to wear, what they do is they repeat the last syllable. So kagir becomes kagir gear. And this extra reduplication means to wear a. So if I had the word for clothing, which could be something, and I repeat the last syllable at the end of the word, it would mean to wear that piece of clothing. So that's an interesting reduplication uh, that we don't have in English. So lots of languages do reduplication. Um, Russian has some for sure, and of course many others. You can look those up if you're interested. But again, that is another uh, pretty important morphological process that just isn't seen in English. Okay, the final one here is stress. So English is terrible with this. Some languages are okay. Um, I say English is bad because we'll have the same spelling, we'll have the same word, but depending on where you put the stress, it's either a noun or a verb. That almost rhymed, kind of cool. Okay, so let's take a look at this word record, 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 record. Stress is different, they mean different things. So a record has stress on the first syllable, so record. But record is record has stress on the second syllable. So you would never say, I'm gonna record that. 
you would say, I'm going to record that. And you would never say, hey, did you go to the store and buy me a record? No, that sounds awful. You'd say, hey, did you go to the store and buy me a record? So that's the first distinction. The second one is project. So a project has stress on the first syllable, but project has stress on the second syllable. So you would never say, hey, I have a project I need to do. You'd say, hey, I have a project I need to do. Or, hey, could you project your voice a little louder? No, you'd say, hey, could you project your voice a little louder? So this distinction in English, when we have a word that can be both a noun and a verb, usually the noun has stress on the first syllable while the verb has stress on the second syllable. Some languages have similar patterns, um, not nearly as common as English does it. English is very stress. Uh, you may say, hold on a second, what about Cantonese? Um, that's different. Cantonese is a tone language, so stress and tone are not the same. So we don't have tonal language, we have a stress language. So this is very prominent in English, and if you are a second language learner, you may have difficulties with this as well. But of course, with practice and hearing other people speak and making note of the differences, that is what is going to help you on these exams. So that was some morphological processes. Next time, we're going to take a look at word creation, how we create words. And that's going to be a fun lecture, so I hope you check out that video when it's released. As always, um, put your comments in, or put your questions in the comments below, and I will try to answer them as best as I can. Hopefully I'll see you in the next video.